That's my serious voice. So if you hear that, then you'll know that you should pay attention and listen because I'm being serious, even though I don't necessarily sound that way. But I really do appreciate the opportunity that you guys have given me uh, this week to talk to you and share with you guys. And I want you guys to know right up front that I'm not sharing with you guys for any other reason than because I really love Jesus and I want you guys to follow him and trust him and learn what it means to follow him more. I'm not sharing with you guys because I'm super wise or have any sort of new message or anything like that to share with you guys just because the gospel is so great that I want to make a huge deal out of it this week and I hope that it'll affect the way that you live your life with and for Jesus. The reality is um, that this week is a really neat opportunity for all of us who are here. It's really cool for me because I get to share with you guys and hang out with you guys and have lots of fun. And I just want to say throughout the course of this week, um, what I do here um, isn't just for 20 minutes in the morning. But if you guys have any questions or things that you want to talk about or whatever, um, you can come and, and talk to me or hang out with me or if you just want to be silly you can do that too. I'm here for you guys. The whole purpose that I'm here is to to serve you and to hang out and have a lot of fun. Um, but uh, with those things in mind I also want to say that this is a big opportunity for you. Not because I'm here but because you have this time set apart for your life. You're not doing anything else this week. You're here you're focusing on growing closer to Christ and growing in your musical craft. And you need to, to really see that as a great chance for you to grow into becoming more of the person that God is calling each of us to be, calling you to be. And every one of us has a lot of growing to do, no matter where we are. And the reality is that some of us who are here today, some of you guys, are playing the Christian game. You're here because you feel like you're supposed to. Some of you guys are here because you're really excited to, to learn about Jesus and, and grow. Some of you guys aren't really sure what's going on because it's still a little bit early in the morning. Um, but uh, we're all in a different place, but for all of us, whether we're interested or disinterested or excited or just whatever, God has something to say and God has something to do in your life this morning and throughout this entire week. So I'd encourage you guys to make the most of it. My goal for this week is to just make a big deal out of the gospel. The fact that Jesus has done something for us that we could never do for ourselves and he's shown love for us that we could never earn or deserve. And because of that, everything changes. And I want you guys to know how, in some ways, that can impact your lives. So um, that's not something that I can accomplish. That's something that only God can accomplish. And I, I would really like it if we just took a second this morning and all just prayed for one another. Because the power of, of God isn't through just uh, one person standing up and speaking, but through his people seeking him and striving to follow him and, and live for him. And you guys know your friends here, some of you guys... Uh, know a lot of what's going on in different people's lives. Now just can we just take a few seconds and just pray that God would work and speak to to us and to the people around us that we would have the opportunity to to hear him and that we would be in a place to respond. Will you guys pray with me this morning? All right, let's let's just take a moment to pray. God, I thank you so much that, that you've brought us all here together this morning. For the students who are here, God, we ask that, that you would just be working um, in their lives exactly uh, for what they need. That you'd be connecting them to your character and to your word, and that their lives would be changed by you. Uh, that they would grow to love you and know you uh, more closely. And God, I, I pray for all all the people who are serving this week, the, the staff and the faculty and the counselors and everybody who's involved in, in making uh, Chehi happen. God, we ask that we would be doing all of those things for your glory. That whatever we have going on, whether it's um, teaching or, 
or just hanging out or, or, or whatever, whatever it is, God, we ask that it would be for you and for your glory and that you would use all of our time here uh, to grow your kingdom, to encourage your people, and to equip these students to be the, the young men and women that you've called them to be. And God, we thank you that uh, you are powerful and that you can work in all of our lives. You know where we are, and you know what to do, and you never fail. And God, we thank you for that this morning, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> Cool. Well, this morning I'm going to start out by, by sharing with you guys a Bible story, and it's a little bit different. A lot of times when people tell stories in the Bible, they share the, uh, you know, the typical like Bible hero type guys, the vacation Bible school, be like this person type story. But this morning uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this king called Nebuchadnezzar. His name is Awesome. And it has the name Chad in it, which is very exciting to me. If you guys didn't know that, and you know someone named Chad, you can ask them if that's their name, because it's a really cool name. But we're going to talk about uh, Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel chapter 2 through Daniel chapter 4. And we're going to kind of fly through. If you want to try and know what I'm talking about this morning and keep up with what's going on, you're welcome to turn there. Uh, we're going to end up landing uh, in Daniel chapter 4, so if you want to go there in your Bible, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, it might be a little bit unusual um, to learn from a guy who isn't seen as a typical Bible hero type person, but we have a lot to learn from the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And a little background on him, he was a mighty king over the, the strongest nation in the world at the time. Uh, he was the king over Babylon, the strongest, most powerful army in the area probably on earth in that, in that particular time period. He was the most powerful person, some people think, on the entire planet. Whatever he said was the law. He was a really, really powerful guy. And one night he was really distressed because he had this dream and he didn't know what it meant. So he was kind of freaking out and he didn't know what was going on. And um, so he called all of his wise people, to come, all his advisors and everything like that to come interpret uh, his dream. But the catch was he didn't tell them what the dream was. He didn't say, oh, I dreamed, you know, about this particular thing, and now you need to tell me what it was. He said, I, I'm not going to tell you what I dreamed, because I don't want you guys to just make up some answers, but you need to tell me what my dream was, you need to tell me what it meant, and if you don't, I'm going to kill all of you. So, kind of high-pressure boss type scenario. If any of you guys have ever had a part-time job, you might have felt like your boss was like that. Get this ice cream cone made, or else you will die. But... Um, <laughs> But this was very serious, and he actually probably um, was brutal and ruthless enough to, to do that. So all of his advisors were freaking out and saying, you know, we can't do this. We don't know what, what's going on. And amazingly, God provided the answer to his servant, Daniel, who was working in the, in the king's court, working closely with Nebuchadnezzar at the time. And God gave Daniel the information that that Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. He gave him the meaning of his dream. So he went and he told him all about the dream and he told him exactly what it meant. And now that's pretty cool. Like if you had a dream last night and um, sometimes people dream weird dreams. Um, and his dream was weird. We won't necessarily go into all of what it was and what it meant and everything like that. You're welcome to look it up. It's fascinating. Um, but if someone went up to you and said, I know what you dreamed last night, and then they told you exactly what it was, that would be freaky. That would be amazing. Um, that would be very impressive. And so uh, that's what happened. And so Nebuchadnezzar was very impressed with, with what Daniel had done. And of course, Daniel, because he was a servant of God, gave all of the credit to God. And this is what uh, Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel 2.47. He said, Truly... Your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. So Nebuchadnezzar is in a position where he has seen God do something really awesome and then he declares the power and the, the awesome nature of God. That God can do things that no one else can do. That God is unmatched. That God knows things that no one else could possibly know. Nebuchadnezzar had seen the mighty 
power of God. And you would think that that would impact his life in a very significant way. That at that point he would choose to become a person who was a devoted follower of God because he had seen the power of God active in his own life in a meaningful way. But sadly, that's not what happened. The next thing that happens uh, is that he sets up this 90-foot golden statue of himself, and he tells everybody that whenever the band plays, that they have to bow down and worship the statue of him. So he had just seen God do this really awesome thing, and he had just declared that God is beyond everyone, you know, that God is the greatest of God, the Lord over kings. He said the right words, but then the way that he lived his life after that was to say, well... I'm going to build this big golden statue of myself and set myself up as the God over God and the Lord above all kings. Certain times, and you guys might have heard the story of, of these guys Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they, they chose to follow the one true God and they weren't willing to bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. He was a little displeased. And even though he knew that they followed the God that he had just declared was the greatest of all gods, he was still very angry and he had them heat up this fiery furnace, this big blazing oven. So it was seven times hotter than, than it was before and he had them thrown into it because they wouldn't bow down and worship his statue. Now, this is when more crazy and amazing stuff. God showed up in that particular situation. He sh saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in there. The people who tossed them in were burned up and died, but they ended up walking out of that oven totally fine. And the Bible even goes on to say that they didn't even smell like smoke, which is awesome. And so Nebuchadnezzar sees this, and this is his response. He says, you can read this in Daniel 3, 28 through 29. He says, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's commands and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god but their own god. Therefore I make this decree, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Now this is a big, big statement, and much more in-depth much longer, much more eloquent than his first statement about God being able to do things that no one else could do. But now he's, he's going into response mode and he's saying, there, there is nobody like this God. There's nobody who can rescue like the one true God does. And so because of that, you know, people have to respond and no one should speak against him because he is so incredible. He is so big. He is so great. He's so awesome. And Nebuchadnezzar had seen God's power once again in an even more obvious way in his own life. Right before his eyes, he had seen a God more powerful you know, than, than the blazing fire. He had seen a God who could do something that was unimaginable. He had seen a God who was able to overcome his power even though he was the most powerful king, the most, the most esteemed man, the most seemingly invincible person on earth. God was able to turn over his plans. So he makes this great statement about who God is and that there's no other God who can rescue like the one true God. And you would think that he was seeing clearly that because he was lifting up the Lord and pointing, he was even pointing other people to God. It was like he was evangelizing for the one true God. You'd think that now he would become a faithful and humble worshiper, that he would become a follower Nope. That's not what happened. He had another dream after that, and Daniel interpreted it. And this was kind of a warning. Um, this was about his own punishment and how God was going to discipline him. And he went to Daniel because he was getting a little bit smarter. And he said, Daniel, I need to know what was going on. And Daniel, through the power of God, was able to interpret this dream. And he, and he told him what it meant. And he said, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. 
So he has this warning from God, this dream, and, and Daniel tells him, you know, you need to change your ways. Even though you're a mighty king, we've seen that God is more powerful than you, and you need to respond to him accordingly. You need to live your life in response to who God is and to, and to what he is able to do and according to what he wants. Nebuchadnezzar knew the power of God. He had seen it in action. It was time to make some changes. But what it says after this is that one year later, he was out on his roof looking at the city of Babylon and he was just overwhelmed by the immensity and glory of his kingdom. And what the Bible says in Daniel 4, 30 through 32 is, as he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone He chooses. And that's exactly what happened. Um, that Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. He wandered around aimlessly. He ate grass like a cow. And his, the Bible says his nails grew out really long like bird claws. This mighty king became a homeless man. Instead of living in a huge palace and presiding over his kingdom, he was living out in the wilderness. And it says that like he was sleeping on the ground and the dew would cover him. The one who had organized armies and planned mighty victories for, for his battles had lost his mind. The king who had power over everyone didn't even have power over himself anymore. God humbled him. And listen to the result, starting in verse 34. This is in Nebuchadnezzar's own words, his own description. He says, After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High, and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, What do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom, and even greater honor than before. Now I... Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. So this was Nebuchadnezzar's uh, next experience with the power of God in his own life. And this time, it cost him greatly. It put him in a horrible position, and he had to live a life that he obviously didn't want to live in order to see clearly who God was in order to have the right response. And we don't actually know um, how Nebuchadnezzar's life ended up playing out. That's the last we hear of him right here. Um, we don't know if he kept his cycle going of seeing God work in a mighty way and saying the right things and then forgetting about him. We don't know if he became a follower of the one true God in a sincere fashion. But either way, there's so much that we can learn from his life. And a lot of it is summed up in Proverbs 1.7, this really famous verse that says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Nebuchadnezzar could have learned a lot from that fact, and we can too. When God works in, a lot, in our lives, we have to respond. And the way that we should respond is through humility and obedience and worship. And here's the thing about following God that a lot of people in our culture, and especially young people today, get confused. And that is that when we choose to follow God and when we choose to live for Him, we aren't doing Him any kind of favor. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. When He chose to make 
Uh, when we choose to make our lives about God, it's not for his benefit. We're not giving him some great gift. It's for our benefit because he has given us the gift of himself. And when we revere him, we're just really reorienting our lives to reality. When we choose to make our lives about following Christ and not other things, it's not that we're choosing to choose, you know, from amongst a bunch of good options. We're choosing the one thing that's actually true, the one thing that is a foundation that we can build our lives on, and that's a recognition that this life is not about us, that it's about God. He's amazingly powerful, and he's wise, and he's far beyond each of us. Check out what Psalm 33 has to say. It says, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into a heap. He puts the depths into storehouses. Let the whole earth tremble before the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came into being. He commanded, and it came into existence. God is so far above us. God is so much more powerful than us. God is so much more wise than any of us can possibly comprehend. But not only is he so far above, but amazingly because of who God is and because of his goodness and because of his great love for us, the same God who created everything by just the word of his mouth and the same God who holds the entire universe together and the same God who invented this universe that we live in and, and created you and your personality and your soul that great, high above, awesome God chose to stoop down to this broken world and enter into it. God who is perfect came down here and we know what this world is like. Invincible and untouchable chose to let mortal men like us lead him to his death. All for the purpose of giving us uh, the promise that if we choose to believe in him and follow him, we will not die. He took our place. And when you think about the fact that this God, the one that we just read about in Nebuchadnezzar's story, the one who does whatever he pleases, and he's in so much control that he gives the kingdoms of the world to whoever he wishes. He's the one who's sovereign and ultimately in control. That God chose to come down here and let people nail him to a cross. Chose to the God who, who cannot die chose to lay down his own life for us. That's amazing. And that's what the gospel is all about. And, and that's how we all interact with God today. We might not be like Nebuchadnezzar where we're having great visions or dreams and people are coming and interpreting. We might, you might not have seen somebody get thrown into a blazing oven and then walk out unharmed because of the power of God. But you have something better. You have the gospel, the truth, that we have a God who reached down into humanity so that he can save us and give us life that never ends. And God desires to work in each of our lives. God desires that each of us respond to him and follow him. And we can look at Nebuchadnezzar and say, man, he was crazy for not following God because he had all these signs and he saw God work time after time after time. But the reality is that people are so easily blinded. And if you look around your life and think about all the good things that you've been given, you didn't have to be here. God didn't have to give you the life that you have. That's an awesome gift from God. And if you look at all the blessings that you've had in your life, all the joy that you've been given, you didn't have to be given that. That's a gift from God. He gave it to you not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, but just because... He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to see his glory so you can worship him and follow him and love him forever. That's incredible. And God has done, each, like, done that for each of us. He's worked in each of our lives in that way, offering us the truth that, that anyone who believes in Christ and chooses to make their life about following him will have life with him that never ends. That's awesome. And when we think about that way, when we think about that, we have to think about what we're going to take away from that. And that is that 
for each of you, and I, I would give this to you guys as a challenge for this week, for your life in general, but you're going to hear a lot of good things this, this week from your counselors and from your instructors and um, here in chapel. When God speaks to you and God works in your life, don't just respond by saying the right things, but respond by offering Him the response of giving Him every part of who you are. Let me say that in a different way. Nebuchadnezzar, whenever he saw the awesome works of God, he said all the right words. You know, when, when God interpreted his dream, he said, wow, God is the revealer of things that no one could know. And when God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, he said, there is no God who can rescue like this. And when God humbled him, he said, this God is sovereign. He is able to make the proud humble and show them who is really in charge of life. He said all the right things, but he didn't back it up with the way that he lived his life. And you guys are here in a place where there's a lot of positive um, peer pressure and um, there's a lot of opportunity for you guys to, to walk the right walk. There might not be all your typical struggles and temptations that you left at home. So it can be easy for us to just say the right things, but not actually offer God every part of our lives. We can often be like Nebuchadnezzar in every step of the way, acknowledge God with our lips, but with our heart, and with our attitude, and with our actions, remain far away from him. Jesus and Isaiah both pointed out how ridiculous it is and how offensive it is to God when we offer him our praise with our lips, but our hearts remain far away. So don't just respond by saying the right things, but as God works in your life, respond by choosing to love God with what Jesus said was the greatest commandment with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Every bit of who you are belongs to Him already, whether you know it or not. He owns you. And he's giving you the opportunity to turn to Him, to repent, and to offer Him not only what He deserves, because we can never pay God back what He deserves, but we can give Him a life of worship. So make your life about God. You know, and Nebuchadnezzar he had a lot going for him. He was smart, obviously. He was talented. He was a good leader. He had resources. He had a ton of stuff going for him. But he kept turning his life away from God, turning his life from, away from God at every turn. And every time God gave him an opportunity to come close, he said the right thing and then walked the other direction. And that's not what we want to be like. And you might have a lot going for you, too. You might be talented. You might be smart. You might be incredibly good-looking. You might be popular. When God works in your life, if you aren't turning towards Him and choosing to devote your life to Him, you're missing the point. Because all that stuff will fade away. Because in uh, 70 years, most of us are all going to be dead. And what, you're not going to be good looking anymore. You're not going to be that popular anymore. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to do that much anymore unless you've been walking with Christ. Because then when we die, we end up having everything that we could possibly have hoped for because we have Him in perfection and in eternity, which, this is redundant, lasts forever. So let me wrap this up. Jesus asked this question in Matthew 16. He said, What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? And that's like a Christian cliche almost now, a question that we're all familiar with to the point that sometimes it doesn't sink in. But just take a second now to think about what are you actually living for? What have, you, what have you made your life about? And has God been calling you to walk closely with Him? And you've been saying the right things, but you haven't been turning your heart to Him. You've been saying the right things, but you haven't actually been choosing to, to follow Him you haven't been choosing to walk closely with the Lord. And if you want to know what it means to, to be obedient to Christ in your particular life circumstances, what that might look like, you have your counselors here and they want to talk to you. You know, they're, they're really fun and 
some of them are goofy and some of them are really tired and might seem like they don't want to talk to you anymore because it's like the end of the summer. But really and truly, they want to invest in your life. And if you want to know what it means to be obedient to Christ, if you want to know what it means to live for Jesus personally, talk to them. They're here to, for you. They're, they're not just here because they love Chehi, because Chehi's great. And they're not just here because they like hanging out with each other. They're not here because they like music. They're here for you. They want to serve and love you. Same thing for your, your, the faculty members. If you guys are in lessons and you have a question about something, it's okay in the middle of, of your lesson to say, I've got this question about following Christ. There's not one of your instructors who's going to say, okay, let's talk about that later. Because the most important thing is, is this, that you don't get anything, even if you gain everything, if you lose your soul. So think about this, that this week. No matter how good your music sounds, no matter the friends that you make, no matter how much you enjoy this experience, none of it matters if you're not doing it for the glory and honor of Christ. And none of it matters if you're not walking closely with Him. And, and that's, that's what I want to leave you guys with this morning. So we're going to take a few seconds. We have a minute. Okay, so I would encourage you guys to use these next few seconds to really think, what am I living for? Am I like Nebuchadnezzar and I'm seeing God work but I'm still just living for my own glory and I'm saying the right things but I'm not living the right way? Or am I actually following Christ? And if I'm not following him with every bit of who I, who I am, what needs to change in your life? What needs to change? Let's just think about that for a second. And God, we thank you this morning that we can meet with you, that we can hear from your word, and that we can be challenged uh, to come closer to you. And God, we ask that you would help us to not just mostly follow you, that you would help us to not half-heartedly follow you or follow you when it's convenient, but God, that you would help us to know what it means to invest every part of our life into who you are. God, teach us clearly that nothing matters if we aren't doing it with you and for you. God, you are worth everything. And if that is true, that means that compared to knowing you, nothing else can even compete with that kind of value. So God, we, we ask that you'd help us to see how much you're worth. We'd ask you to, we ask you to help us to see how great the gift of the gospel is, that you would stoop down and love us the way that you do. And God, we ask that you would help us to respond rightly. God, don't let us just say the right things. Don't let us just go through the motions. But help us to really respond by offering you every part of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. So that when we see you work in our lives, we would respond by giving you the glory through our words and our attitudes and our actions and our talents and our time. God, we want everything to belong to you. And we ask that you would use your mighty power to accomplish this in us. Because we know that we need you, and apart from you, it doesn't matter if we gain the whole world. And it's in your awesome and mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to share with you this morning. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to talk to me anytime. Cool? Yeah? Uh-huh? All right.